together. I don't know Tim Tebow's mom, but she said she he said that she told him this all the way growing up. And, and this is going to be something that we're going to practice around here, okay? So let's say it together. Sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. Say it again. Sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. Now, you're smart. You know what that means, but I'm going to tell you anyways. You can get a lot more out of folks if you'll talk nicely to them. Here we go. The title of the message today is Thy Kingdom Come. Let's read together in chapter Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. The Bible says this. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of sharing your word. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in the midst of this people thus far. And now I'm asking you, Lord, that you will help this pastor to speak words that you have anointed and ordained for today, that you will open all of our hearts to hear from you and to receive and put it into action. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I plan on being short this morning. And give, I want to give uh, the ones that were just up here singing and playing, I want them to be able to come back in just a minute. And we're going to have a time of closing where you can respond around this altar. And so I want you to keep that in mind. One day soon, Jesus will return for his people and establish his kingdom forever. I believe that when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and don't, don't keep reading your Bibles right now. I want you to keep your Bible open to Matthew chapter 6. And in a few minutes, we're going to come back and read the, the Lord's Prayer. He, he taught his disciples how to pray. And he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And when he said that, I believe what he's talking about is the day when he will return to earth and establish his kingdom. Uh, it will be the beginning of his kingdom forever. There will be a thousand year reign of Christ on this earth. And then after that, there's going to be eternity in heaven. Now, there's a lot of Bible teaching that goes in behind that. I don't want to get in that today. But I believe what he's talking about is the day that he begins his final kingdom by establishing his kingdom on the face of this earth. And I'm looking forward to that. But I believe there's a, a, a subcontext meaning behind this also. Because he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he goes on with the prayer. And we'll talk about that. But I believe what he's talking about, church, and I want you to get this. That we are to practice kingdom living while we are here on the face of this earth, while you and I are living and breathing in this life, we are supposed to be about the business of living in the presence of God every day. Kingdom living now. Now, if you're a theologian, I don't want you to get me mixed up with kingdom now theology. And if you know what that is, that's not what I'm talking about. If you don't know what that is, forget about it. It's not important. But I'm talking about kingdom living today. And that's what I want to talk about today. The priority of God's rule being established in our lives. What is the kingdom? Well, back in Bible days, people understood when you talked about a kingdom. Uh, they, they understood about kings and they understood about principalities and that kind of stuff. You and I live in the good old United States of America and we have a president and Congress and senators and representatives of all kinds. Is, is, is my microphone doing funny things here? No. no? Okay. Sounds funny. Just don't want to mess you up here. So what is kingdom? What is he talking about when he says, thy kingdom come? Well, I want, to, I want to translate that today into, into what I think would be a modern understanding of it. Uh, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but uh, I don't believe that I am. Not taking it out of context, but one thing that he's talking about, kingdom, he is talking about God's dream, God's vision for this world, the way that God wants this world to be. Like I said in a minute ago, when Jesus comes and establishes his kingdom on the face of this earth during the thousand year reign and then after that in heaven for eternity, it is going to be exactly the way that he planned for it to be always. But right now, God has a dream and a vision for this world that you and I work to establish his kingdom 
on the face of this earth by establishing His kingdom in our hearts and lives. Do you believe that we're living in a different world than what you grew up in? Do you believe that things have gotten worse instead of getting better? Young people, I'm not talking to y'all. Y'all don't know. <laughs> you don't know. <clears throat> Do you know what the difference in the world is? Do you know why it's different today than it was when you were a kid? Do you know why it's different today than it was when you were a young person? You're the difference. I'm the difference. If I will live kingdom values, if I will live kingdom minded, then I'm doing what I can do in this world to make it a, a, a God-friendly place. But if I'm not living kingdom values, then throw it all out the window. Why should I expect the world to be old-fashioned when I'm not old-fashioned? Why should I expect the world to be like it was in kinder, gentler days if I'm not kinder and gentler and living by the priorities of God? So the kingdom is, it is God's values. It is God's plan. It is God's priority for this world working itself out in my life. I want to talk about kingdom values. Now I'm going to read some scripture. It's going to be on the board. But I don't want you to turn to your Bibles. I've got something else for you in a minute. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 22. There, now you see, you see, was going out on the road. One came running and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That, that, that is a young man. We're calling the rich young, young rulers. We find out he was very wealthy. Verse 18, Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. 19, you know the commandments? Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Stop right there. All these things I have kept from my youth. In other words, he's saying, I've been good. I've been good. There's nothing wrong with me. I have been a good boy all my life. You know what? I think a lot of people do that. Right here at Glad Tidings Assembly of God. I think, I think when, when, you, when you talk to people about kingdom living, about living for Jesus, they'll say, I've been good. Ain't nothing wrong with me. Yeah, well, what about you did this? Well, but I also do, I, I, I made up for it. I'm sorry and I'm doing bad. Well, what about you did this? Yeah, but I've been good. I think if you went around asking people in this church today, they'd say, ah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm good. Jesus said, this is the way you have eternal life. You, you do not break the commandments. This and this and this and this. And the boy says to him, hey, I'm all right. I haven't done any of that stuff. Listen to what he says then. Where were we? Verse number 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you like, go your way. Say, where am I here? Sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. He said, I've been good. I want y'all to say that with me. I've been good. I've been good. Say, I've been good. I've been good. Hang in it. Hang in it. He said, Jesus said, Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Do you remember another place where they said, they Ask Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? They're trying to trick him, catch him up. You know that back in the old, back in the, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there came a group of religious leaders called the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And between them, they had, they had hundreds and hundreds of rules. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. And, and they had all kinds of stuff. Living for the Lord was not about relationship for them. It was about not doing a bunch of stuff. How many of y'all heard that story before? And so they come to Jesus and they say, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus took them all and watered them up into one big wad and he said, the love God. And they were like, whoa. You can't argue with that. And then he said, and then love people. Love God and love people. All right, back to the story. We've got a rich young man that comes along and he's saying, I've been good. Everybody say, I've been good. Have you there? Thank you. I'm glad you have. Jesus said, he, he put his finger on the one commandment that the young man had not been keeping, and that was that he did not love God. What's the Bible say? Exodus chapter 20. 
The Lord said, He gave the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God and have no other God before you. Jesus said, you Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The boy says, I've been good, but you know what? He hadn't been loving God. Kingdom values is about loving God first and foremost. Listen, I want, I want to invite you to look into the mirror of God's Word. Get on your knees in prayer and say, God, help me more than anything that I will love you. Church, it's not about all the stuff in our lives. It's not about having a good list and having a bad list and our good list being longer than our bad list. It is simply about loving the Lord our God. And he put his hand on it right here when he told this young man, he said, you go and sell everything and come and follow me. Look, he said, Jesus looking at him, loved him. God is looking in your life today. And you know what? He doesn't see stuff that other people see. He doesn't see stuff that maybe you see, whether it's good, whether it's bad. You know what God sees? He sees a soul that he loved. And that he sent his son into this world. His son died on the cross. He sees you and he loves you just like you are. And he's not standing up there today with a big old stick. Waiting to whack you on the backside every time you mess up. What he's doing is looking at you and loving you. And asking you to come and love him back. When he says go your way. Sell whatever you have. And give to the poor. What Jesus is saying is come and love you. Don't love this other stuff. Love me. God wants you. Kingdom values is about loving God. I want you to, I want you to, we're going to do the thumb test just a minute, okay? How many of y'all know what the thumb test is? We get so much stuff in our way that we have a problem seeing priorities correctly. All right? How many of y'all can see the screen very clearly? Can you see that real good? All right. I want everybody, I'm trying to get out of here. I want everybody to look at it. And then I want you to take your thumb. Put your hand up in front of you with your thumb up like that. Do that for me, will you? All right, you're looking at the screen and your, your thumb's between you and the screen. How many of you can see the screen still with your thumb up there? All right, I want you to do something for me. I want you to close one eye. Put your hand over it if you have to. All right? Isn't this fun? How many of you can still see the screen? Look at me just a minute. Your thumb is smaller than the screen, right? Everybody agree? Looking with one eye, you can still see it. Now I want you to bring your thumb towards you like I'm doing right here. I mean, bring it all the way up until you cannot see the screen anymore. You see what I'm talking about? Now, your thumb, many, 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 many times smaller than the screen, but if you bring it up here, you it's in the way, right? It blocks your vision. It, 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 it obscures your focus on the screen. Here's my point. Many, many, many of us have little bitty things that are really of no eternal value. They are of no value whatsoever, but they are the priority in their lives. We have them right up here. And God has so much greater things. God has so much more for us. And we're letting the little bitty things in our lives block us and we can't see past it. And I, look, I listen, as I was there, as I was seeking God for the message today, I found God saying some stuff in my spirit. What I believe that God was telling me is we are living below our privilege. We are letting little bitty ungodly things control our life. We're not living by thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We are not kingdom minded. We have settled for second, third, fourth, fifth, best. We sometimes even worse than that. What we are doing is way down on the priority list. And God is saying, look, I want you to focus on kingdom values. Jesus told us to pray and he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We know that prayer, but does it mean anything to us? God wants us to get a hold of Him. Let Him get a hold of us and, and rise up to where He's called us to be. We settle for the worst when we can have the best. Listen to what I'm going to tell you here. We belong as a child of God. How many of you a child of God? Say amen. amen. You believe that. You're born again. You have asked Jesus Christ into your life. You are a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The creator of all the universe. The ruler of all the kingdoms of this world. He is God. He is creator. He is the giver of life. He is the sustainer of life. And you belong to him. And he doesn't want you living down there below your privilege. But for
for some reason, we clutch and we hold on to our ways. We're afraid to let go. We live in fear, afraid to let go of what we know, what, what we treasure, what is close to us. We're afraid to let it go because it is our security. But if we'll let it go, God has so much more. He has a higher place, a closer walk with Him. The Bible says, Jesus said this, He said, you cannot love God and money. Don't have love of money in your life. It's a security for a lot of people. Some of you say, well, I've got none, so it ain't my security. You don't have to have money for money to be your security. You don't have to have money for you to love money. So there's some people that don't have two nickels to rub together, but they show up. And I'll tell you what, the, the, the opposite is true. There are some people that's got more money than they can spend, and they don't care a thing about it. It's not about how much you have or how much you don't have. It's how you feel about it. Don't love money. You cannot love God and money at the same time. The Bible tells us to love the Lord with all. Jesus said that the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. Some of us are afraid to get close to God. You know what I'm saying? Some of us are afraid to get close to God. We're afraid of what He might do to us. We're afraid He might mess us up. We're afraid He might ask us to do something that we really don't want to do. I'm going to tell you something. If, God, if you don't really want to do something, if it's not something that you will ultimately love, God will not ask you to do it. I promise you that. You might not think you're going to love it. But if God asks you to do something, if God, if God puts something in your spirit to do, if God has commanded you to do something, you're going to come to love it. You might not at first. But you know what? You're going to wish you would have later on down the road. You're going to live in regret. You get down the road and you're going to say, God was taught, calling me. You know, I cannot tell you the number of people over the years that have grown up and grown old and said, I believe God called me into the ministry and I, and I missed it. I missed it. Well, he may have, he may not have. But I'll tell you what he did call you to do. Put your hand in the plow and not look back. He called you all that your hand finds to do. Do it with all your might. He tells you that in his word. You don't even have to second guess that. Maybe, maybe you miss God, but I want to tell you something. God still has his best in store for you. It might not be in front of a church preaching the gospel. You don't call everybody to do that. A lot of people feel the call of the ministry and what God is saying is, come, work in my church, work in my kingdom. Let my values be your values, not the other way. We're afraid what he might ask us to give up. Some people hold things so dear, so closely. That we're afraid. If I, if I give this up, what am I going to do then? You know what? God has better things for you than you can ever hold on to for yourself. Afraid of what he might ask us to do. We want to hold God at a distance. We love the things of this world. We love our lifestyle. Most of us are accustomed to eating the dirt from the ground. When God wants to eat man from heaven. You get that? Oh, I, I'll tell you what. I want to live on heaven with food, don't you? Can, you? can you get what I'm saying? There, there is, we are living below the kingdom of values. Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. It's not going to be on the board. I want you to look in your Bible. In this manner, therefore, pray. Let's read it together. Maybe you've got a different version. It'll be okay. We'll read it anyway. Let's read it out loud together. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Teach us how to pray. And he teaches us how to pray. And he says that we're to honor God. We're to, we're, first and foremost out of our lives is to honor the name of the Lord our God. And then to pray his kingdom come and his will be done. And then to pray for the things that we have need of. And then for us to have a forgiving spirit. He says if you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. And then he asks us to pray that we'll, that we'll not be led into temptation. You know, God has a plan and a desire for you. And you can find it all right there in the Lord's Prayer. Too many of us hold on to hatred and jealousy. Too many of us 
hold on to the perversions of this world. I want you to listen to this preacher for just a minute, okay? Here we are, the church family, the glad tidings assembly of God, church family. God doesn't want you living below your privilege. He doesn't want you thriving and, and, and wallowing in the trash of this world. Too many people are. Too many people do. People sitting right here this morning, God loves you. He loves you. He's looking at you right now and He's loving you and He's saying, look, please, Come up out of that. God will lift you out of the depths of the miry clay of this world. He wants to set your feet upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Sometimes people get so dirty and they've been so dirty for so long, they don't even know. Years ago, I, uh, an old man told me, he said, when you smell yourself stinking, everybody else has been smelling you for at least three days. A lot of times we're, we're, we're so nasty with the things of this world. We come to church, we raise our hands, we pray, we ask God to help us and bless us, we ask God to forgive us, but we're still in the process. We're still constantly living in the muck and the water of this world. We don't even recognize how dirty we are. And I'm talking about living below kingdom values. I'm talking about living below our privilege. God wants us to live in the blessing. Kingdom blessing is what I want to talk about next. Matthew chapter 11. And I'm almost done. Jesus says, Come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. He's talking about the, the, the rules, the regulations that the Pharisees put on everybody. They wanted everybody to be so saddled and strapped with rules that they couldn't even hardly move. They couldn't breathe. They couldn't do anything for fear that they were going to break one of the laws. God doesn't want you that way. He wants you living in the blessings of relationship. He says, come to me, you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen to this preacher one more time. I want, I want the singers and musicians to come right now, if you will. While they're coming, don't pay any attention. Just listen to me. What Jesus is saying here. Kingdom values, kingdom living. It's not about trying to live like the preacher says. It's not about trying to live like the Sunday school teacher says. It's not about trying to live according to a set standard of rules. What he's saying is that he wants you to come close to him. He's going he's to take the yoke of this world. He's going to take the bondage that, that other people might try to put on you. And he wants you to take his yoke. He said, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. But what we don't understand is that we got to come close to Him and let God do that work in our lives. I don't, I don't want you to live below your privilege. God does not want you to live below your privilege. He loves His church. He loves us, church. He loves you just like you are. Maybe you're saved, good. God's got a work to do in your life. Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. God has an awesome work to do in your life that you need to humble your heart before standing for this morning. Let's just sing this song together. All right.
If you're here today without Christ as your Savior, if you don't know where you'll spend eternity, whether in heaven or in hell, why don't you come and let us pray with you? Otherwise, Christian, if this is your prayer, Clay, Clay came to me before church and he said, Brother Joey, I feel like we ought to get around the altar and worship this morning. I said, You invite me, God. Put it on your heart, you invite me. I already had it on my mind that I was going to invite you to come around this altar for a few minutes at the close. I've saved a little bit of time here. If you'll come around, I believe this is a good way to wind up service today. Come on, let's get around this altar and worship the Lord. If you need salvation, come and talk to me right here. Go ahead.